This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All right. Um, welcome to the first seminar of the Studies, uh, uh, studies of Home seminar. <laughs> got that right, I would still call it Histories of Home, Studies of Home seminar uh, for 2014. I think we're probably one of the earliest kicking off seminars in the in the IHR, so all power to our elbows. Um, and I'm delighted to uh, be able to uh, welcome Bruno Blondet from the University of Antwerp, who's very kindly come uh, across, no doubt, or under a choppy channel um, today. Uh, Bruno is a, a s- sort of kingpin of the Centre for Urban History at the University of Antwerp and is involved in many various projects, uh, some of which have had recent publications, including um, a soundscape of the early modern uh, low country cities, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, And most recently in Continuity and Change, an article on time consciousness in the early modern low country households more broad and more broadly. Um, I'm uh, sort of indebted to uh, Bruno and his colleagues for uh, work on alternative economies and second-hand exchange, things that uh, I've become uh, very interested in thanks to his and their work. Um, And obviously I'm extremely excited by the fact that somebody else is interested in kitchens, uh, which is what Bruno will be talking about today. Before we start, uh, has everybody signed the register? If not, can we make sure that that goes back? Um, brilliant. So uh, I will uh, open the floor to Bruno, uh, who will be talking to Beyond Cooking, Reading the Material Culture of Antwerp Kitchen in the Long 16th Century. Yeah? Okay, um, uh, many thanks for the introduction uh, and for you as well for coming here. I feel a little bit guilty since when I accepted this invitation I was pretty confident to arrive with a a comprehensive, well thought, well worked out paper and yet uh, here I am with a much more work in progress piece of work than I had hoped to offer, yet turning this into an advantage perhaps, it may uh, offer opportunities to harvest uh, yeah, comments, uh, suggestions and perhaps also strong critiques, um, undoubtedly. Yet, uh, and, and the work ha- the work that I will present is not only much uh, a, a, a work in progress uh, piece of work, it's also a joint work which I am prepar- preparing with uh, Inike Bautzen and Julie de Groot of the Centre for Urban History. So, um, <coughs> and one one of the starting points of uh, our analysis is the very fact that in 16th century Antwerp a new painting genre originated, uh, which was very popular and would inspire painters elsewhere in Europe as well. Uh, a rich kitchen uh, scenery. Uh, this is a, a Beuglar piece which I'm showing. Indeed, apart from their market stall paintings, Pieter Aertsen and Joachim Beukler, Beuklaar introduced and established the kitchen area as a prime locus of religious and moral actions, such as the visit to Mary and Martha or the dinner of Emmaus, for instance. Kitchen, Keukenstukken, kitchen scenes, in which the kitchen is depicted as a space defined mainly by its cooking facilities. Witness the boiling, the the fresh meats, the vegetables already partially cut and sliced by the cook. And it were especially the meticulously painted foodstuffs, kitchen utensils and tableware that were considered uh, an artistic or at least product uh, novelty on the painting market. In a way, indeed, these kitchen and market scenes formed a kind of 
a meaningful prelude to uh, uh, yeah, still life paintings. Um, now, although attention is drawn first to the kitchen area on the foreground, in most cases uh, the major theme is always confined to another uh, space in the background, which in a way reassert, <coughs> reasserts the kitchen as uh, a backstage room in the house. The major scene of the uh, of uh, the event happening was located elsewhere in the house. <clears throat> and typically such paintings would include the combination of a, um, an event, a biblical scene, and the proliferation of utensils and foodstuffs almost at the threshold between the painted scene and its viewer. Now, it's easy to describe what has been shown among art historians, and I'm far from an art historian, so I will ne not uh, take up the challenge to start interpreting these uh, paintings and these sceneries, but uh, among art historians, little agreement indeed has been reached uh, uh, on the exact and nuanced meaning of such sceneries, which can include moral, satirical, allegorical messages, uh, perhaps uh, a, a kind of Erasmian critique, uh, um, a, a, a pleading in favor of modesty, uh, or an ironic question mark behind the splendor, wealth and unstoppable drive towards materialism in 16th century Antwerp and 16th century urban life in general. I will not go into detail on the discussion on when, it's, when it comes to discuss what these uh, paintings were supposed, the messages these paintings were su supposed to convey, but importantly enough, already contemporary, uh, uh, say, art uh, connoisseurs like Karl van Mander in his 1603 Schilders book praised among others, Arsen for uh, his kitchen scenes. He painted kitchen scenes, he says, filled with all kinds of comestibles and foodstuff, as if they were real, as if they were objects mimicked, as if these objects mimicked nature themselves. Now, though a large debate in art historiography exists on the symbolic meanings of this kind of scenery, uh, interestingly enough, little attention in uh, the art historical literature has been given to the specific objects and the specific pra everyday practices that were occurring in the kitchen. And that's, <coughs> the, that's in, in, in a way, the major topic of this uh, of this uh, talk since while the 16th century Antwerp painting market gave rise to the birth of this new genre and, 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 and a very appealing, popular one indeed, uh, it's, it is striking to see and it's how historiography has hardly done justice to the kitchen as an important study matter in itself. There are a couple of exceptions, of course. But still, we know a lot about the, the studiolo, uh, the, the salette, the neerkamer in the house. Uh, unsurprisingly, mainly masculine venues of the home, by the way, that have attracted already a lot of scholarly interest. Uh, our, but by contrast, our knowledge of the more mundane, ordinary rooms still remains in its infancy. And this holds true, especially for the kitchen. <coughs> Obviously, the kitchen, in many respects, seems to be a much less attractive room. It is more or less subject to a presupposed histoire immobile of hardly changing everyday practices and often associated also with female and backstage labor. 
whether this, whether or not this historiographical neglect and prejudice is historically rooted in 16th century elite thinking and architectural treatises is open to discussion. But indeed, if we are to follow or believe uh, architectural treatises such as the one of Al Alberti, uh, then a strong um, line, demarcation line, can needs to be drawn between, on the one hand, those rooms that in the house that were furnished to welcome visitors, to organize convivial dinners, and those parts of the domestic interior which had a less front stage character. According to Alberti, indeed, the kitchen was such a backstage area, uh, which, as is the case in Artsens and uh, Beuglar's pictures, uh, needed to be located in proximity of the representative rooms, yet at the same time clearly isolated from them. In 16th century humanist treatises and thinking as well, this demarcation line coincided with a highly gendered occupation of room use and the confinement of certain household functions to specific rooms. And building on this, some authors even have called the gradual appearance of functionally specialized rooms and kitchens especially as, uh, as a means of paving ways towards modern living patterns. Now, <clears throat> whether or not the appearance or more or less functionally specialized kitchens can be interpreted as part of a linear process towards modern homes uh, can, can be disputed and I wouldn't, don't like to go uh, into that discussion, uh, since it might not be the most intellectually rewarding one. Um, but strange as it may seem, these claims, these claims about kitchen as a space lived and experienced by 16th century city dwellers has hardly been backed by empirical research so far. And it remains far from certain whether or not any functional specialization was actually applicable to the kitchen. Um, and that's the challenge which I, would, which I would like to take up in this lecture, to confront uh, the, the painted kitchen scenery of the 16th century, which is suggesting a female cooking area, specialized cooking area, in, uh, in the urban context, at least, um, on the one hand, um, backed also by architectural and humanist writings and thinkings of the 16th century, on the one hand, and I would like to confront this with the everyday practices of the actually lived in uh, kitchens. Before turning to yeah, the analysis. I would like, however, to withdraw a little bit, step backwards, and 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 in a, just a few words set the scene of this contribution, which is but part, albeit an important one, of course, of a larger project on uh, on the material culture of. Um, the Low Countries in the 15th, 16th centuries, um, say, and at home, yeah, in Renaissance, in the Renaissance Low Countries project, which somehow was inspired by the famous Goldweight claims about the way in which fundamental transitions in material culture in late medieval 16th century Italy triggered somehow what he called a drive towards a modern consumer society. Yeah. Uh, a, a major claim or a rhetorical claim which was somehow backed by descriptions in which indeed uh, large proliferations of household goods uh, in, in Italian homes could be recorded. Um, which
which somehow coincided socially and culturally with um, an, an increasing um, yeah, somehow a dom an increasing domesticity, say, of material domesticity of the Italian uh, home, the, the, the Italian casa, a process in which houses were really turned into homes, um, and, and a process which was backed somehow or driven somehow by fundamental product and process innovations in which increasingly design and decoration gained at the expense of intrinsic value. Um, there has been enormous criticism, of course, on this uh, way uh, to look at, uh, on, on this way to, uh, to describe material culture changes of late uh, medieval Italian context, um, especially since it was narrowly focused on Italy. Um, on, on the exceptional position of Italy, while increasingly we know that not only elsewhere in Europe, but also in China, in Japan, etc., very similar processes often could be recorded. It was extremely biased in favor of urban elites, if not urban, often urban mobilities. Uh, and most importantly, also, of course, it, it, it somehow it embedded a concept of modernity in which the story of this functionally specialized kitchen in the Italian context was taken for uh, uh, as a sign at least of functional specialization and modernity. I'll, in, in this talk I'll move the attention to the Low Countries and though we have evidence on Broges and Audenard as well, I will now focus on Antwerp material. Um, for obvious reasons, Antwerp was in such a close and intensive contact, being the major commercial and economic hub of the 16th century, uh, housing hundreds of Italian merchants and heavily influenced by as you can see also from the design of uh, the, the 16th century town hall, which is more or less the first palazzo outside Italy in northwestern Europe, uh, heavily influenced by perhaps Italian conceptions and hence why not about by Italian principles on the way kitchens need to be arranged and, and, and used. Um, and on the one hand, that's one major reason. Another major reason to tackle Antwerp, firstly, is that it is a much more than the Italian context, of course, a uh, bourgeois society. And I will not go into detail about the larger project, but it's for, for the purpose of this lecture, it's important at least to recall that none of the developments recorded in Italy uh, seem to be not applicable to the Antwerp context of the 16th century. Um, the same extreme proliferation of household goods, uh, whereas at the end of the 14th century people could make do with a couple of uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 different objects, at the end of the 16th century, uh, they were supposed to have long lists of very uh, functionally specialized and uh, objects, a kind of consumer choice dress even uh, arrived, a whole series of um, product and process innovations of which the rich kitchen scenery serving a, a bourgeois market with new ones and etc. of course is in itself uh, yeah, one of the uh, new or innovative uh, consumer product, products. But, un but unlike, of course, this, uh, this major Goldthwait, um, say, drive towards the grand narrative, I would like uh, to step uh, forwards again and dig into the everyday practices of uh, the kitchen. Um, which need at 
to be understood in the context of this extremely rich, uh, at least in comparative 16th century uh, perspective, extremely rich uh, society and this, yeah, let's say, extremely vivid material culture. So, and that's a structure of the argument which I will follow in the, the following, say, 30 minutes. And, and let me start just by briefly introducing you to the, the, the major database which uh, has been used for, the, for this lecture and I will unevenly, since it would, be, uh, it would lead us too far and would be boring to document every uh, uh, sentence and every aspect with detailed quantitative material from all kinds of sources. So I will unevenly pick uh, examples and, and evidence stemming from two separate series of uh, probative entries. One, one, the one which I've been working on especially uh, for years already, are the notarial probate inventories. And um, while well, the other uh, major corpus and a very a new one, brand new one, are uh, confiscation records uh, of the 1560s in, as a result of religious troubles, iconoclasm, and um, these relate to uh, uh, persecuted Protestants uh, that, whenever they fled. Um, saw their goods and movables confiscated and, and yeah, it would lead me too far to go into the details and, and the, the opportunities and the drawbacks of the two uh, main uh, corpora of sources but uh, it's important to note that um, the notarial private inventories tend to uh, over-represent richer Antwerp uh, inhabitants, while the confiscation records especially uh, relate to yeah, middle-class people. And <coughs> it will pop up continuously during the presentation. That's why it's important for me now to introduce you to the, the general uh, schedule that I've used to uh, socially break down uh, the, the material. Um, all probate inventories introduced in the two uh, databases were ranked according to the number of rooms people used in, at home. Uh, in the absence of external criteria, tax assessments or uh, general indications of um, the appraised wealth of the inventory or whatever, in the absence of external criteria, uh, we were obliged to, um, to, so, to categorize our inventories on, on the basis of an internal criteria and we finally opted for the number of rooms, which somehow gives an impression of course of the general um, uh, wealth of a family, and yeah, while category one is relates to one room dwellers, category five and six relate to people occupying more than twelve spaces. Uh, for you know, for several reasons, they were now grouped in, in one category for this lecture, but it doesn't matter too much. The most important things for us is in order to have a, a rough idea about what these categories in socially stand for or represent is that we um, the most important thing is now to, to look at the, the percentage of uh, inventories with a workshop um, and as you can notice in, especially in category 4 a large percentage of uh, probate investory to stay <coughs> had indeed a workshop at home. The phenomenon starts clearly in category, among the staters of category 3, people occupying room uh, about 7 
six to eight rooms or something like that. Um, but then with a heavy emphasis in category four and again uh, a major fallback in category five and six. It is especially these inventories which in the confiscation records database are uh, heavily overrepresented and which will be used uh, uh, dominantly in this lecture. So this lecture is not, not so much, though I will spend some attention on it, about a very rich kitchen. It's about, it's also at least or to an important extent about the moderate, the modest kitchen. And then, <coughs> turning to the conclusions or the, the observations of the research. And the first and a very obvious way to assess the material was to go and, and have a look on, at the <coughs> yeah, category threes, between four and seven rows, excuse me. It was the first and most obvious way to go and have a look at these inventories was um, to look at the percentage of inventories in which a kitchen actually was recorded. And unsurprisingly, among, among the one-room dwellers, um, though in some sample periods I have some one-room dwellers who just lived in a kitchen, or just occupied one kitchen, uh, but in fact, at least in this sample uh, it's nearly absent. Uh, this holds true for the category 2 as well, where only a minority of people really had a kitchen. But then, whenever you move ac across the threshold of four rooms, people will almost always have a specially dom denominated, uh, functionally at least uh, you know, identified kitchen. And if we go and have a look at the 1630 material, which is uh, at the end of the long 16th century, and which relates to the to the notarial probate inventories, then uh, uh, we see a very similar phenomenon. And I just, for reasons of comparisons, I just uh, I've chosen a couple of other rooms. And the thing which is clearly shown here that is that at home it's the kitchen that's the first and the most important one to be functionally specialized um, um, of course and then importantly of course it is uh, um, it's almost yeah you know, it's obviously om omnipresent uh, but then in in a, a very important observation as well when one moves in upward in social hierarchy, uh, the number of kitchens and the names given to them, uh, people, the number of kitchens people have seem to be very inconelastic. And uh, the stages of category four and five, um, of, especially in category uh, five and six, for, uh, excuse me, often, often have already uh, a grand kitchen a small kitchen, probably also a buttery, these kind of things. So, compared to, for instance, the situation elsewhere in the Low Countries, this functional specialization, this occurrence of specialized in, uh, kitchens is quite early and quite um, yeah, distinct. A similar, but of course, the way in which a room is called, and especially given the, the long etymological roots of the word kitchen, of course, and, um, and, and, and is a very crude measure of or very crude way to assess what really happens in the kitchen. And really one of the most obvious ways to approach uh, uh, the real uses of the kitchen is to go and have a look at the way, uh, the, the question whether or not a kitchen was still slept in. 
even, uh, even though that might be, uh, even though that might be open to many interpretations, of course. People may sleep themselves in the kitchen. They, it may, the bedding may have served uh, the nightrest of a servant maid, or um, and 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 of course, depending on who used uh, the bedding in in the kitchen, uh, for what reasons, uh, the interpretation on the real uh, significance or meaning of a bed in the kitchen would. Uh, <coughs> would be completely different. Now, what you have, what I did project here on this graph and, and a couple of others following which the same method was used, is not a graph on the absolute presence of uh, pillows, beds and bed frames and sheets, etc. in kitchens and other rooms at home, but it's, uh, it's a ratio, ratio expressing um, the, the ratio between uh, the number of sheets, pillows, bed frames, beds, etc., one would expect in a kitchen or in a room, uh, supposed under, uh, un under a zero hypothesis in which there is an equal distribution of all these objects at home, um, the ratio of the actually <coughs> recorded or observed um, objects in a room by the expected um, number under a zero hypothesis and which in, in which implicates that um, observations below unity below one indicate that um, compared to what one would expect if objects would have been uh, distributed randomly uh, um, the objects, in this case the bed frames etc uh, are less represented in a room and uh, observations above unity uh, of course uh, yeah, have uh, the opposite meaning or interpretation now, <coughs> The nice thing about this way of approaching things is that it immediately becomes clear that uh, even though, especially among less rich testators, even though quite frequently kitchens were still uh, equipped with beds and bedding, um, already in the 1560s and among, especially among more modest urban uh, dwellings, you know, um, kitchens were less frequently used for sleeping purposes than one would expect. Um, of course, this is a specific context of Antwerp in the 16th century, uh, which clearly differs markedly from, for, 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 for instance, what happens in the northern low countries, but still. And <clears throat> this again, as was the case with the naming of the kitchen, may serve as an indication, of course, of how um, yeah, a kind of a functional specialization process, as one would <coughs> expect judging the rich kitchen scenery, um, judging the architectural treatises and, and contemporary mindsets, of course, of how indeed a kind of a functional uh, specialization process might have uh, taken place, <coughs> which does not indicate, by the way, that uh, sleeping as such is necessarily uh, unprestigious, on the contrary, if you look for instance at the Neerkamer, which is the most important and most frequently uh, uh, a room most frequently equipped for uh, conspicuous consumption and representative purposes, 
Um, then if you look at the Neerkamer faces, then you see a high, a large overrepresentation, of course, of sleeping. Uh, everybody knows how important the bed, uh, um, not only within the marriage, but also within the symbolic mindset of receiving guests, etc., was, of course. Uh, and moving half a century later to the early 17th century, to notice that um, the number, the percentage of kitchens in which still people do sleep uh, has considerably dropped um, on, the, on the one hand and again if, uh, if we look at the same kind of ratios then uh, we see that at that time not only has uh, the number of kitchens and grand kitchens in which people do sleep or well, the proportion uh, considerably diminished at that time also the Neerkamer, that most representative frontage room already, philo uh, already figures below unity so that's, that's a chronological process which has been taking place. So far, a very coherent story seems to be uh, told. We not only have this humanist thinking, this architectural thinking, this rich kitchen scenery, also some of the uses of the of the, of the kitchen seem to support the hypothesis that in this affluent commercial city of Antwerp, very soon and comparatively very early a functionally specialized kitchen uh, has emerged which um, whether one which is also very gendered of course uh, place uh, whether this is then dotted with uh, positive meaning, as in the thinking of, for instance, the humanist Vives, who considered the kitchen as a, as a, as a place of work and, and piety uh, for, the woman, for the BS woman of the house, whether or not this is regarded as a, a, a positive thing or rather as a, as a solution to keep away women and the smell and the noise of the kitchen from the more important and public affairs of men um, is open to discussion, yet so far we have a pretty coherent picture. I will have to disappoint you though, since a closer reading, in a closer reading of uh, the 16th century material for Antwerp, reveals a very different uh, picture um, and the first observation relates to eating. In, in her work on this subject matter and on the paintings surrounding the eight saal, the dining rooms of the home and the kitchens, uh, Claudia Goldstein has emphasized the the, the major divide between the prestigious dining room on the one hand and and the female backstage kitchen on the other hand. Yet, and I will not go too much into detail, but if we, uh, when we started recording all the materials related to, uh, to dining and to eating, to our, uh, uh, to our big surprise, uh, it was, it turned out that especially the kitchen seem to have been used not only as a place to prepare the food but also to consume the food even among people who had enough space available at home uh, to organize dinner elsewhere and um, yeah turning to the 1630 uh, notarial material for instance if we if we look at individual plates and drinking utensils uh, but it could be multiplied by many other things 
such as, for instance, the spittoons, uh, then, um, then obviously the only place in the house um, in, in, in which all these objects pop up, though I know how difficult it is to infer from the presence of the objects the specific uses, that's of course a major caveat, but <clears throat> the clustering is such and it's so preponderant um, that it, and, and, and it's, it's also backed by, as we will see, by the presence of uh, tables and eating tables and, and the, the seating furniture, etc. Et that we can be pretty confident that the major social venue or the major convivial venue at home <coughs> in, in the 16th and even in the 17th century, uh, Antwerp home was not the Neerkamer, was not a dining room, which by itself was a very exceptional room. Um, only a few people had a really uh, specially demarcated dining room. Uh, but it was the kitchen, <coughs> and, uh, and, and in, in this respect, the major difference between the, the, the small kitchen and, and the grand kitchen is also, of course, highly supporting the hypothesis of the kitchen actually being used uh, for dining purposes. If you look at the spread, the relative spread of uh, uh, seating furniture, then I, I, might go, I might go immediately to the, the next one, since it's a, a clearer one. Um, then making use of the difference which sometimes was recorded between male and female chairs. Yeah. Um, female chairs, especially when, when uh, Spanish chairs were considered, were <coughs> often a little bit lower. Uh, um, they could be armchaired, as were male chairs, but it, 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 the difference seems uh, to relate uh, mostly to the you know, to the height of the of the chairs but if you look at the dif as, uh, again at uh, the difference between male and female chairs from the ra ratio perspective then um, yeah clearly enough it is the the, the gender nature of the kitchen as a, as a place um, is, is clearly evident. One expects the in, in the most prestigious rooms of the house um, the, the incidence of both categories, specialized categories, is much higher than elsewhere in, in the house. But the, the difference, of course, between the female and the male representation is completely different, or completely, is different in the kitchen, uh, or differs between the kitchen and the neerkamer, which again seems, seems to support the hypothesis of um, yeah, this gender divide and this front stage, back stage, uh, if. Um, Divide, but yet <coughs> the very fact that male ch chairs were not not at all absent in the kitchen, though underrepresented, yes, but not at all absent. And if we look at especially at the, the extremely lux luxurious leather gilded Spanish chairs of the 16th century, then at least to our su surprise we discovered that a very high percentage of, of these female backstage places was equipped with very expensive uh, Spanish chairs. These Spanish chairs were not only expensive at the time, they were so, from a qualitative point, so, uh, yeah, so nice a furniture that we still, in the Antwerp regimes, we still have lots of these. Um, they were also, from a qualitative viewpoint, very uh, well-constructed chairs. Um, 
uh, uh, it's it's m much more difficult to find a decent 18th century chair, for instance, than, than a, a Spanish chair. Now, and uh, what surprises most is how how frequently also these kitchens were equipped with these uh, Spanish chairs. And indeed, if you look at uh, um, the odds for paintings to be uh, uh, to be recorded in, in in different rooms, then very obviously, and again, the contrast, of course, between the Neerkamer, the, the most representative and presupposedly uh, more male, etc., etc., venue of the home, uh, where the, not only the portraits but also the flower pieces um, and and and. and Probably also the larger paintings, etc., etc., were hung. Then, then indeed, the difference between the neerkamer and the and, and the kitchen um, is uh, uh, very great. T to my surprise, for the 16th sample, uh, the grand ch kitchens were were not so much equipped with uh, with paintings. But still, um, given the space available in the kitchen, where of course lots of uh, the walls were also used to stall uh, plates, etc., etc., given the space available, uh, it's remarkable how many, how many paintings normally a, a, a kitchen would have, even among the staters of category 3 and 4. The median number of paintings in the 16th century in the kitchen is already three to four. Um, in, in the 1630s, it's two to three. But still, quite a lot of paintings were often recorded in the kitchen. And strange as it may seem, or while the, sc the scattering of subject teams across the house was pretty random. With an exception, for instance, for portraits, which were more likely to be found in the near count, etc. There is one specific cluster of uh, paintings that it, that is really uh, seems to be really specialized when when it comes to uh, to its location at home, and 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 that's indeed these markets and kitchen sceneries, and while. While, for instance, paintings on Last Suppers or other paintings related to eating practices, etc., could be found randomly across the home, uh, uh, it is kitchen scenery is largely overrepresented in the kitchen itself. <coughs> yeah, and I would ju ju just like to end with. Another indication of uh, perhaps it's difficult to say what it really means, uh, but the but the holy water front the, the holy water fonts were extremely overrepresented in both uh, the neerkamer but to a larger extent in the kitchen, which given the pres presumed dying practices in the kitchen is not, a, uh, is not of course unexpected, eh? and <coughs> and if you allow me to a little bit read through the conclusions. Um, are still far from complete and I hope that some discussion might also help me to, to enrich both the analysis and the interpretation of course but um, it's safe to say that in the end uh, at least in my opinion a strange paradox has come to the fore eh? the cultural idea of the kitchen is 
was dished up by painters like Peter Aertsen and Joachim Beukla, his follower, seems to recall the much debated idea of functional specialization, and since most attention indeed in kitchen scenery was given, was given to cooking practices. These paintings gained in popularity throughout the 16th century, especially, and they did so especially in Antwerp. <coughs> now, yeah, in this exercise, we've compared kitchen scenes and contemporary ideas about the kitchen and about the way it needs to be arranged according to humanist thinkers, its implications also for gender roles. We have been comparing them to the everyday material reality, as it was mentioned, at least in probate inventories. And indeed, the kitchen was a clearly distinct, recognizable, and almost only omnipresent room. It was, in fact, the most important one to be labeled according to its specialist function within the house, and it had a more or less distinct, and say, a more female chapter. Yet, the objects that were recorded in this room tell a much more layered and nuanced story. Rather than mere gendered and low status cooking places, kitchens were crossings for all members of the households, and they did serve different social purposes, not in the least as a venue for the convivial moments of the household. As Sarah has described for the early modern kitchen, we can also argue that 16th century Antwerp kitchen provided a backdrop for the mix of different social, gender and age groups that crossed the household. At the very heart of the domestic acti activities, the hearth itself supported the kitchen in its role as a major nexus of multiple household capacities. Therefore, the kitchen cannot be reduced to one specific genotype room, nor can it be grasped in terms of functional specialization, of course. The very emergence of prestigious and multifunctional great kitchens, the grand kitchens, in houses of rich urban dwellers summarizes this paradoxical evolution. People who could have afforded to withdraw social activities from the predominant presupposed, predominant female kitchen eventually preferred to invest in multiple kitchens, hence rather than, say, abandoning the place and, and uh, investing more in the Neerkamer, etc., etc., at the same time, the grand, the grand kitchen, as well as the kitchen for people with only one such room, was uh, laden with a prestigious, convivial and sociable meaning. Perhaps this may also have been a reason for the popularity of the kitchen scenery, of course, on the painting market. In the end, and this is very speculative, of course, but it's tempting, and it's no more than speculation, to interpret this favorable position of the kitchen, which deviates much from both the Italian practices and the Italian prescriptions, and even from Salonellanish humanist thinking, it is tempting to interpret this favorable position of the kitchen in a mercantile urban context that was generally known for its more equitable gender, gender relationships. The confiscation records at least seem to uh, not to falsify this hypothesis. Contrary to the contemporary theorizing, the female character of the kitchen was not at odds with a key social role or even with a key uh, splendor, splendor role. The kitchen brought all members of the household together. In this respect as well, the actual kitchen deviated not only from the painted representation, but also uh, from you know, the contemporary elite, elitist mindset. That's it. Thank you. Had a drink because we didn't even yeah. open. So, <laughs> open. Yeah, have a drink. Um, okay, I'd like to open the floor to questions. I'm, I've got lots of questions, but that would be a bit unfair. So let's. Um. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about. Um, obviously, you talked a lot about the previous inventories. Um, 
I was just wondering what other sources you're going to use for the broader project, really, in terms of getting at these sort of more distinct everyday practices, how you're going to build up that picture. Um, uh, yeah. Can you rephrase it a bit? Is, uh... Yeah, I'm just wondering what other sources you're using in the wider project. Yeah, yeah in the wider project, uh, uh, literary evidence and, and uh, of course, uh, will also be introduced. Uh, uh, a, a large deal of attention is also paid to prescriptive literature, which, uh, again, in this case, seem, seems to balance more in favor of, of a functionally divided uh, kitchen, yes. Um, um, there is the iconography, but I must be fair to say that uh, so much time went into the database that always the backbone of the analysis is um, in the objects themselves, which is up to a large extent also problematic, of course, since um, it's it's not impossible, but often requires a kind of an ingenuity to infer uses and practices, let alone meanings, which is even much more difficult. But in any way, use and practice from the mere presence of, uh, of objects in, in rooms. Um, yeah. It would be unfair to say that we are going to balance all kind of source materials, though in the larger project it's complemented and, and we did our best at least in this paper as well to introduce some of the evidence on uh, literary evidence on kitchens as well, of course. Yeah. Jane and then Victor. Oh, it was very interesting to uh, hear about some of the uh, decorative goods in the kitchen, such as the paintings and uh, the Spanish chairs. I wonder if you could um, say a bit more about the other material culture in the kitchen. Were there more ornamental objects or were the other things that you found in the inventories um, more apparently functional? Um, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I've, I've just of course chosen examples and the examples were not in a, in a way not randomly chosen since yeah of course paintings um, um, are in the 16th century context where people say a median household would own 14 16 paintings so uh, the, the, the quantitative Base is large enough to, to draw at least relatively strong conclusions from it. <coughs> but it could, and, and of course, I could have, have talked about, um, and, and in the written out version, there is much more material about the real uh, cooking equipment and, um, and, and the tools that were uh, used for washing, etc., often were uh, found in the kitchen as well, and, and these kind of things. But at the other end of the spectrum, we also found, uh, for instance, uh, um, the mirrors, um, frequently mirrors in kitchens, um, and, and things, even things such as board, uh, board games. Uh, board games, yeah. yeah board games uh, were, were not at all absent there, which also is heavy. So the, the, the presence of uh, the the presence of say washing equi equipment did not prevent uh, games from being um, also recorded in the kitchen. It, it is this it is strange mixture which at least led us to suppose that. The divergence between the theory of the 16th century and the actual practice was extremely large, and that the growth of the wealth of most of these households did not lead to a functional specialization in which the kitchen grew less important, 
perhaps on the contrary, it was dotted with extra meaning and uh, which can indeed be inferred from you know, the, the prestigious place of the grand kitchens, eh? where then these things were you know, omnipresent eh? or things like games and so on. So, so I was going to ask about the historical archaeological evidence. Um, what, what, what do we know from the historical archaeology of the period in relation to finds and the material that you're looking at? Yeah, the, the, difficulty, um, uh, the difficulty with the, historic, the, the archaeological evidence is that um, uh, the nice thing is, is that it's, it complements the property inventories enormously. Since, for instance, uh, one, of the, um, one of the objects which is somehow iconic for, say, Renaissance product and process innovations is uh, crystal and tin glazed earthenware. Um, <coughs> and, um, but strange as it may seem, um, we often, we frequently f find them in these inventories. Yeah, you know, Antwerp was one of the first uh, major production centers for tin glazed earthenware. From where it was re exported to elsewhere in northwestern Europe uh, ever since the, the early 16th century. It was a major yeah, supplier of the northwestern European market. But both uh, copy historiato uh, tin glazed earthenware, uh, which are you know, say genuine themes and decorations, decorative schemes um, from from the Netherlands themselves, <coughs> but um, relative to the key importance of Antwerp as a distributor and producer of Maiolica, uh, we were surprised to find relatively low numbers. Now, interestingly enough, um, um, archaeological evidence, both from production sites as, and, and from yeah, waste pits elsewhere, uh, in, indicate indeed a very large market of high-end luxurious historiato, both but also very large amounts of, of everyday products which, which as a result of their cheapness uh, may not have popped up um, to the extent one would expect in the kitchen. <coughs> but it's much more difficult um, of course given the fact that most archaeological evidence relates to waste pit uh, material, it's much much more difficult to, re to relate it to the specific locations and use within the own. Um, but for instance, when it comes to Maiolica, when I have, when when we are to believe the the property inventories, then both the the Neerkamer, uh, where for instance, when Whenever there was silverware on display, it was not in the kitchen. That's for sure. But seldom. Yeah. The differences are that big that it's... Um, in the case of Maiolica, I think there is earthenware as well. In the 16th century, um, the, the odds for the important Neerkamer to have... <coughs> A vase or whatever on display, on the, perhaps on the, the, the mantelpiece of the, the hearth, uh, um, were much larger than in the than in the kitchen, where Maiolica was not at all absent. Again, yeah, supporting the idea that the kitchen, albeit uh, on a very on a low, much lower scale, was not at all an unrepresentative room. And interestingly enough, in 1630, um, it's a, a similar observation can be made. Uh, 
with porcelain, and then genuine porcelain of an imported fire to touch. Um, and especially, yeah, imported porcelain flooded the southern Netherlands markets, especially during the 12 years truce, of course. And then in the 1630 sample, it was porcelain was more likely to, to be found as was silverware in um, in uh, in the in the or the salette at that moment, um, while maiolica was dominant in the kitchen. But in all periods, pewter is heavily over overrepresented in the kitchen. Which it's spec very speculative, but historians always stressed the, say, the interchangeability of pewter and silverware. Both are product categories which not only represent, uh, which only have a decorative or functional or whatever, but also have a prestigious and a conspicuous value. Which they, which they often derive not from the design, of course, but from the intrinsic value of the raw material used and the alternative uses, since to a large extent, of course, silverware and pewter fulfill really monetary functions and can be changed, uh, even melted down, pound, etc., etc., as we know. <coughs> and this may very well be the case. And, but clearly, in the mindset of the home, these are different object categories. Um, you'll sell pewter is underrepresented in these front stage rooms and heavily overrepresented in within the kitchen. Um, archaeological evidence it's a splendid complement to our research. Yet it's it's extremely difficult to social socially break down where we have quite sound architectural design of our database and a, a nice idea but this is where the master craftsmen and shopkeepers are this is the social category below them and this is above at, at least a, a tree divide of the you other know, society pops up from our research we have a clear idea and that's of course the difficulty with it's difficult to match this complementary and very interesting artist archaeological evidence to, um, you know, to the social research structure of our project. No. It's still a challenge. Can, um, I think you had the, uh, one of the slides with the different uh, other, lots of different types of things like if heating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can you put it up again? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm interested in heating so I just want to see the slide again because I don't have time to see it. This one or the other? The, 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 the easier uh, one? Uh, uh, yeah, I think. The, this one. Seating, the work, the sleeping display, hygiene. Heating, okay. Uh, yeah. I have, I have no particular question, but I'm not sure what line it was, so it might have been this one. <coughs> so it's heat, heating yeah. sources. Ah, yeah. heating. Yes, heating. Ah, so. Heating. Yeah, but heating is, of course... Yeah. What's it's, heat? it's almost tautological, of course. <laughs> okay, so what, what other rooms had heating? Um... Yeah, I don't have uh, yeah I don't have the material with me here now, but um, yeah. When it comes to heating, um, yeah, lots of rooms had uh, the near counter was most likely to be heated, but also lots of rooms upstairs uh, often were. Um, but there is, a, a, there is a major difference between what I'm now saying often and frequently, etc., and having the right percentages, but I, I don't have them in mind. So if, if you would be interested, I could produce, if, if you're particularly interested, I could produce, easily produce a statistic and, and, and send it or whatever. But um, now, generally speaking, it's pretty well distributed uh, across. 
customized home. Um, lots of places were good. Um, with brand hazards, uh, uh, fire, uh, uh, fire irons, and, and these kind of things. Yeah. And are they burning wood? Or <coughs> what, are they, what, are they, what are they burning? And is there uh, a differential between what's being burnt in the kitchen and what's being burnt elsewhere and, in the household? And, and that, unfortunately, that's one of the things. Uh, um, Antwerp in the 16th century is to a large extent provisioned with heating or with energy uh, by, you know, how do you pronounce it? Peat or pet or peat? Peat. Peat. By peat as well. Uh, but um, whenever, um, whenever um, quantities of wood uh, and, and, in, in, and then again the, the sources discriminate between small wood and, and the nice pieces, etc. Um, and peat and uh, even coal. Uh, are, are mentioned, uh, they are always mentioned in the cellars. Um, I don't, I've no, I've not a single observation of a, of a located, uh, so most probably the notary or the clerk didn't pay too much attention on, say, three pieces of you know, uh, firewood. In, in the near camp or the kitchen. Um, so I honestly said I don't know. But they all uh, they all appear and interestingly enough um, people frequently had different kinds of so there is a good chance there is a good chance that uh, they may might have used uh, different uh, heating sources in and especially peat, it smells more. Uh, in fact, there are good reasons to suggest that if they had a small kitchen in which lots of the cooking, the actual cooking was done, that perhaps they may have, may have used the cheaper etc. peat there then. But yeah, that's just uh, you know, deductive reasoning. It's not historical evidence, so I don't dare to to push the the idea too much. Do you, do you have the relative values of, for example, I was thinking of your kitchen in near camera. Is the value of the beds and bedding, Spanish chairs and paintings similar in the two rooms? I just wonder if the second best end up in the kitchen, or you can say no, you can't see this. Or yeah, um, this, this can only be inferred in an indirect way. The very fact that silverware, etc., uh, is, a, is more frequently recorded in the near camera also presupposes the very fact that uh, prestigious Lady Camden, prestigious Benning, etc., is overrepresented in the near camera relative to other places and especially to the kitchen, and um, yeah, suggests, of course, that there is not only a, a, a hierarchy in the kind of objects and in the number of ob objects, but also in the relative value. Unfortunately for me, <laughs> the Antwerp property of entries are not appraised, so we don't have values. I'm the only historian. If ever I would have had values, <laughs> I would have burned through my <laughs> So they're, they're, they're merely li the lists of objects? List of objects. Not uh, nothing, no more or less. Yeah, it's, it's, it forces us to make a creative use, of course, yeah. of the material. Otherwise, yeah. So you. I just wondered, do, do you have information about where in the house the particular rooms are? I'm thinking, for example, in, in, in Italy in the 15th century, in your patrician houses, the the kitchen will be in the attic, whereas the 18th century. It'll end up in the basement, and that tells you something. I admit these are the top end houses. I mean, do you have some equipment? Yes. Um, like this that might throw light on their roles? Yeah. Um, most, in fact, it's, it's not. 
it's not that clear cut, but most of the kitchens would be in, would be backwards in the home. Um, next to the, the courtyard or it's uh, the ground floor. On, and, and they would also be on the ground floor. There are at some there is incidents of uh, some cellar kitchens. Uh, yeah, I think that's you know, the roof. And houses? Uh, the attic, you say the, the attic? Actually, in the attic. attic. Yeah, yeah, yes, in, in the 15th the century, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, in the... Not at all. But in the, the cellar happens, but it's mostly the ground floor. And uh, as can be inferred from the order in which rooms are described, which very often they start with... Uh, very often they start with the kitchen and then they move in front of the house. It's, um, um, but in, in the, predominantly it's the ground floor and uh, at the back side of the house. Yeah. In terms of interpretation, I, I wonder if you, you thought about seasonal usage. I mean, if you think kitchen is a place you're always going to have heat. And in the winter, if you want to save money, go to the kitchen. <laughs> It'll be warm there. So I wonder, I wonder if there might be a pattern of usage, which might be winter, where everyone sort of huddles in the kitchen, to put it extreme. And in the summer, people might be all spread out or, 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 or being more functionally specialised. I, I, I guess it's, it a good be... it's a good question or a good suggestion. Uh, the only thing is there that I'm, uh, I think, confronting the limits now of the sources, which will not uh, allow us to... Uh, It might be one way if you, if you know when they died. <laughs> yeah, when I mean, the inventory is drawn up, but. The inventories are dated. Yeah, they are dated. But I, my, my, honestly, my fear would be that uh, if I have to break down the sources in, according to the, the, the season. No, I, I, think, I, think, I, think you, I think you need a, a different type of source for that. I mean, for example, in, in, for, for London in the 18th century, you can look at, 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 at early fire lighting times in the summer in court cases in kitchens because you know you want to get you know you want to get your boiler heated up in the in the cool of the morning rather than you know do it when it's really really hot particularly because you're in the basement by then for the majority of kitchens and it's a hell hole but you know I think you need a different type of source than the ones that that perhaps you've you've got you know you, you're using um, and I'm not sure whether the date and inventory is taken, you know, really helps you then think about the seasonality of use of the objects. It, it, the objects may remain in the kitchen, you know, regardless of what time of year the person dies. Whether they're used is. <laughs> but but overall, of course, when it comes to discriminate between between the Italian case and say the North, Northern European case. A major reason for the kitchen to continue to be socially and culturally more important and less uh, functionally specialized it might have been the energy question since it makes sense especially in the 16th century when energy is growing extremely expensive of course almost at the rhythm of uh, the necessities themselves, the foodstuffs themselves. But then, uh, I've been thinking about the argument previously, but then that would not explain the reason, that would not explain why, for instance, in the 18th century in Pierre which I have, the kitchen is much more a cooking place than it was in the 16th century. Uh, while overall the Antwerpers have grown much poorer in the 18th century and the relative cost of energy might have been much higher than in the 16th century. Is this still a social change, you think, then? Yeah, in the case of Antwerp, but Antwerp is of course pretty unrepresentative since from a major, say, a, a major commercial and metropolitan hub, <laughs> it, it becomes a, a little more than a provincial town in the urban hierarchy, so with still lots of um, millionaires and very rich families um, 
but overall with a very 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 weak say ill social structure in the 18th century so that's yeah that's at least no basis for generalization uh, for elsewhere but yeah the energy argument is is an important one Well, I mean, it's, a, it's an argument that, that, that might help explain all the other all the other non non cooking stuff in there. You know, in, yeah. in, in, in degree, if you want, if you if you if you want to enjoy your, I mean, in 17th and 18th century English urban kitchens, you've not only got your you know some image images mirrors, but books, you know, yeah. um, board games, um, you know that sort of thing as well. That that's where you know if you're going to if you're going to burn expensive fuel in there, you want to you want to maximise its usage for other activities as well. The, the nice thing that is also in the early 20th century, people like Le Corbusier dreamed of a technical kitchen as a laboratory, etc., etc. And and even people have prescribed. Yeah, the technical and modern kitchen of the 20th century. But in practice it didn't work. And Le Corbusier complained about even his house being appropriated in a completely wrong way by the households <laughs> where, where these multiple uses. Um, popped up over and over again, as they do today of course, since I don't know for in the English case, but in, in Flanders, the the blurring of boundary between the living space and the kitchen is enormously today. So it, that's that's an important message, of course. You you cannot it cannot as as uh, Raphael Sarti, for instance, has done, be fitted into a long linear process of whatever functional specialization of second mm -hmm. spheres or whatever. Uh, it's much more complex and layered. Uh, but it's also historically congen congenitant since the 1630 case is not the 16th century one and, and differs markedly from the 18th century one. So it has to be contextualized yeah, over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no general, of, uh, at least as, as far as I'm concerned, or, or uh, the other case is concerned, uh, I cannot draw a straightforward, coherent history of the kitchen. Um, yeah. And well, I just one question, just one last question, <laughs> and, I, and 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 that's about the 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 the, the, the holy water fat yeah. fonts, <laughs> because I think you know that I mean that's such an important. You know the, the fact that they're overrepresented in terms of what you'd expect, yeah. you know, brings us back to sort of larger questions about what actually everyday means and the place of religion in the everyday. Because in modern everyday studies, you know, the ev everyday is somehow despiritualized. De, you know, it's it's it's, it's an area of routine and yeah. you know, sort of non-emotional. You know, activity, yeah. and so I think it's quite important that you've 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 got a, a sort of nice little piece of material evidence to show a, a spiritual. Yeah, well it's a it's a practical thing, yeah. but it's showing the, the 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 importance of that space. You know, in relation, as you say, to the eating, but the whole eating as a as a as a as a as a um, what's the word? Sacred. Yeah, sacred. The commensality. Okay. You know, yeah. Yeah. The cons. You know. The. the yeah, and, and, and perhaps a similar thing can be said also about, though it's unclear whether it's more allegorical or satirical or moral or whatever, but at least that something is going on with the kitchen scenery. Mm -hmm. and, and a similar thing can be said whether or not, and it may be also a dialectic process, but Somehow, suppose these have, for instance, a strong moral message. The very fact that they are hung in the kitchen may somehow uh, enrich everyday practices with a spiritual dimension. But conversely, of course, these everyday practices may also 
yeah, enrich or somehow yeah, give another meaning to the paintings that mm. were hung in the kitchen, of course. But that it is much more than a place where uh, of materiality, and where things are cooked, is 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 really clear. Since holy water fronts may have been related also to real, I would say, everyday use, uh, uh, but uh, also <coughs> other religious symbols such as crucifixes, etc., etc., were also overrepresented in the kitchen. So mm. it's uh, it's <coughs> it's, a, it's a room with a marked religious character. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, apart that, I was wondering if you could add a bit more in terms of the imagery in terms of, as you say, I mean, it's the background and images of foregrounded activities that are reversed in images. I mean, images back, show the background yeah. activities, or are usually the foregrounded activities which are more religious in nature, but it just is wondering what specifically are those images, I mean, in, of religious nature that we see in the background? Uh, um, in a sense, there's an element of commensality in the wider cosmology, as uh, so that's important that theme has been brought up uh, in terms of um, not seeing this as purely materialistic tactical terms, but really more wider cosmological terms, in terms of what the activities of the kitchen have, in a sense, enable. Yeah, I uh, And I, I would say that I, while reading through the art historical literature, and I, I've, I've, I've made reference to the Emmaus uh, and, and, and the Feast of Mars, etc., but I didn't pay enough attention to give an answer at this moment, since uh, no, I, I would have to look look it up again, um, and, and never thought about going pushing. Yeah, that's that's of course my problem. As I said, I, I don't try to, I don't dare to engage in the larger discussion on on the actual meaning of the rich kitchen scenery, since. Whenever I discuss it with art historians, lastly with, with Bloom, for instance, you, know, you always get another interpretation, and and and, uh, <laughs> and, and so I didn't. I never pushed the analy analysis so far, uh, let alone to interpret these uh, religious scenes. Uh. But I think it's fascinating yeah. that you've got you've got them emerging in Antwerp. Around about the time that you've got this efflorescence of the stuff in the kitchens as well, it's almost as if people like you know yeah. Van Etzen and uh, Etzen and Bukala have you know now have the props in order to produce these images yeah. as well as the you know the moral and 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 I think you know heavily heavily you know sort of the, yeah the, and, and the, the that's for sure there there is. Um, uh, yeah, it's enormous. The, in 1384, when an Antwerp dies, he's entitled to a, a, a set of goods which are to, supposed to be decent goods to start a home with. And I don't know exactly what the list is about, I don't know, 30, 40 objects, the, the horse, uh, the best metal piece, uh, at the end of the 16th century, it's a hundreds. The list contains hundreds of objects, um, including even specialized things, uh, such as the best painting, uh, um, and, and a whole array of uh, also cooking and eating utensils. And if you look in these inventories, then uh, indeed waffle irons and in fact, the, the, the expansion of, of specialized cooking gear also is, is enormous. Uh, and, and, but who, lots of people have speculated, uh, Elisabeth Honig, uh, Sullivan, etc., about the relationship between this uh, material abundance on the one hand and, and, and the painted scenery. But yeah. I started as an economic historian. So I've made a long way in approaching cultural <laughs> history, but this last 
step. Step is just a giant leap. leap. <laughs> and maybe a, a small step for many of me. It's a giant leap. Uh, I'm just very modest on, on that point. So, uh, if, if ever I would like to dig more deeply in that, I, I will just seek support of, of other people who are better placed uh, to speculate about it. Yeah. It's weak. It's a weakness, betting, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't. I don't think it's a weakness. I think it's 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 uh, natural natural skepticism <laughs> of overly uh, overly elaborated uh, elaborated explanations, perhaps. Anyway, um, unless there are any more questions, it's time to drink. <laughs> using some of those overrepresented drinking utensils. Um, before we before we leave and thank uh, uh, Bruno again for his very stimulating um, paper, uh, just a reminder that the next seminar, uh, and I'm not going to point at you, Jane, <laughs> is uh, our own Jane Hamlet uh, speaking on the 5th of February. Uh, I don't have, know whether we've got a room yet on uh, institutional interiors in the 19th. It's in here, is it? In the 19th century. And then the third uh, session before Easter is on the 5th of March on um, I said, the patterns, wallpapers, tw 1920s, and I've forgotten the name. Anyway, um, but you can find all the details of the of upcoming uh, seminars on the Centre for the Study of Home website. Uh, I think that's all our announcements. Yes. Anyway, so uh, thank again, Bruno, for coming. Uh, and, Many thanks for the invitation. Uh, brilliant. Thank you.